Hinana Farab, head of Department of Geology, to deliver the welcome address. Organized by Tempe College of Arts and Science, Geology Department. As all of us yes, we are yes, also sixty years of our college. So to commemorate the Diamond Jubilee celebration, is for the students of geology across the state of Goa. Speakers. Hello, very good morning to all of you and warm welcome to this lecture series organized by Geology Department of Dempe College of Arts and Science, Miramar, Goa. As all of us, we are aware they are celebrating 75 years of independence of India that is Azadika Amrit Mohotsav. So also we are celebrating 60 years of liberation of Goa and our Dempe College has also completed 60 years of its foundation. So in order to commemorate the Diamond Jubilee celebration of our college, we have organized this lecture series wherein we have guest lectures invited from different fields. There are research fellows, then guest speaker from petroleum companies, mining engineers, and also the expertise who can guide us on civil service examination. So we have first speaker for this lecture series, Mr. Srinjoy Datta who is research fellow at Banaras Hindu University in Uttar Pradesh. This lecture will be followed by Johan Andrade, who is performance life engineer working for Slumberger Petroleum Company. Then next guest speaker, we are having Akshay Kerkar, who is my engineer. for this lecture series. So I welcome all the guest speakers and my students for this lecture series. Uh, without wasting much time, I will introduce our first speaker. It is my privilege to introduce our first guest speaker, Mr. Srinjoy Datta. He completed his BSc in Geology 
from Ferguson College Pune and MSc in Applied Geology from Goa University where he was my student when I taught at Goa University on ad hoc basis. I remember him as an always inquisitive person with constant thirst for knowledge. Post MSc, he cleared graduate aptitude test in engineering in 2019 followed by CSIR JRF with All India rank of 28 in 2020. Such a feat is very rare to achieve uh, clearing both the examinations. Currently, he is pursuing his PhD as a junior research fellow at the Center of Advanced Studies in Geology, Banaras Hindu University, Varanasi, Uttar Pradesh. He has rich five years research experience in the field of igneous petrology, geochemistry, precambrian tectonics and magnetic anisotropic studies. His main interests are crust and mental <coughs> dynamics through work on Precambrian mafic igneous axis, particularly dike swamps and associated volcanic rocks from the Dharwar Craton, submarine basaltic ridges in the North Central Indian Ocean. To his credit, he has published one research paper in international journal, has attended more than two conferences and presented two posters. I hope the students attending this lecture benefit from his rich research experience through his talk on the topic Mafic Dyke Swamps, Processes and Prospects of their studies. I request Srin Joy to take charge of the session. Srin so, Joy, yeah, 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 unmute and share your presentation. Yes, you are audible. Yeah. Um, is the presentation visible? Yes, visible. Hmm. So, uh, thank you, sir, for the glorious introduction. So, a very good morning to the dais, the respected teachers, and um, the dear students. So, without wasting any further time, today I'll be talking about mafic dike swarms, processes, and prospects of their study. The framework of the presentation will be around, like I will be introducing the large igneous provinces, uh, like what they are and how they are manifested on the surface of the earth. Then I would be talking about why do we actually study mafic dike swamps and what is the philosophy behind it. As my research work is in Dharwar Craton, so I will be giving a short case study on the dike uh, swamp scenario in the Dharwar Craton. And then I would be giving you some cues or some um, idea about how to identify dike swarms via uh, remote sensing and uh, in the field. Then I would be talking about the methodologies and prospects of research in uh, dike swarms. And lastly, I would be giving you an idea about the motivation of research, like how to get into the research and what should be the approach towards any kind of research. So large igneous provinces and their surfacial manifestations. So what is a large igneous province? It is basically an intraplate magmatic province. They, uh, we can call it a large igneous province it, if its surfacial extent is more than 0 0.1 million square kilometers and volumetric extent exceeds 0 0.1 million cubic kilometers. And they need to be essentially emplaced within a short uh, span of time which is around 1 to 5 million years and not exceeding 50 million years because uh, such large volume of magma to be emplaced on the uh, surface of the earth within this short amount of time is something not very common and then like these uh, this emplacement it needs to occur it generally occurs uh, in the form of a single short duration pulse or multiple pulses of magma effusion Uh, is generally magma source is generally related to a plume or a hotspot origin that is uh, like there is a lot of debate regarding where the magma comes from but the general belief is that uh, it comes from the core mantle boundary uh, the subducting plates generally subduct uh, those subducting plates which move to the core mantle boundary or the d prime layer they undergo uh, partial melting and is due to negative buoyancy and uh, density contrast, this magma comes up and um, causes large scale uh, voluminous surfacial magmatism. <clears throat> this is a map of the worldwide Phanerozoic LIPs. If you can see the age is 0 to 500 million years, 
this map I have taken from um, Large Igneous Provinces book by Ernst Richard Ernst, published in 2014. So you can see that the, there are many Large Igneous Provinces all over the world. Um, and they are not only Phanerozoic, like here we can see those which are Phanerozoic. I will be discussing mainly about the Precambrian LIPs. There are some examples, um, like Indian examples, as we know, is Deccan Volcanic Province is uh, one of the most well-studied large igneous provinces in India. Even the volcanics uh, present in Goa, that is those in uh, um, uh, Anjuna and um, this um, Arambol, Agwad, those are related to Cretaceous Deccan Volcanic Provinces. And as we move to the northern part of India, in covering parts of uh, Bihar, Jharkhand, West Bengal, uh, we know that the large igneous province present over there is La uh, Rajmahal traps. They are generally like, they have been dated to be older than uh, Deccan Volcanic province. Deccan Volcanic province has an age of around 60 to 65 million years. And uh, Rajmahal traps is of mid Cretaceous period. The world examples, uh, and like there are many, but I am naming two over here, which is one is Afro-Arabian LIP. As the name suggests, it covers parts of Africa and Arabia and Emission LIP, which covers parts of Southwest China. Now, how are these LIPs manifested on the surface? Like, what do we see? Like Deccan traps, when we mention Deccan traps, the first idea that comes to our mind is basaltic lava flows. Like you have seen pictures, you have seen um, photographs from Mahabaleshwar and other parts of Maharashtra. They have series or like, thousands of meters of lava flows and these each flows like they are steps in they occur in the form of steps and these flows can be dated and they can the geochemistry can be studied and we can actually identify the number of pulses that have occurred in a particular area then in an LIP even like the total time span at the earlier and the later stages of the LIP where there is lower degree of partial melting uh, we get alkaline complexes and associated carbonate, carbonatic rocks. Now the magma which is uh, pooling under the surface of the earth or rather below the crust, they need a pathway to come up. So how this magma comes up is in the form of mafic dike swarms or sill complexes. I believe that uh, the third year BSc students know what dike swarms are, but I'll still give them a general um, idea about it that dike swarms are a group of dikes which occur in a particular trend and they are discordant intrusions. Discordant means that they are not parallel to the general um, strata of the country rock over there. And sill complexes are uh, concordant intrusions within the surface of the earth. <clears throat> now, why do we study dike swarms? Now, LIPs, as I have earlier mentioned, that we see the lava flows of LIPs today those are the Phanerozoic LIPs or those or some LIP, uh, LIPs are even active today, like those of the Hawaii uh, or Iceland. But the LIPs of the Precambrian time, mm, that is uh, those which have occurred in the Paleoproterozoic times, in the um, Archean times, those LIPs have suffered years, millions or billions of years of erosion. So the um, thick um, succession of lava flows has been eroded. Now what? is left of these LIPs is the plumbing system that is the dike and the sill complexes. So if we want to study the LIPs of the Precambrian times, the dikes and sill complexes are the only way how we can um, look into them. <coughs> uh, over here is a, a photograph from Samal Lethal 2019, which demonstrates the way magma generally comes out of, uh, comes up from an LIP. So you can see the map mantle plume over here, which um, like it can directly supply magma um, to the crust or it can cause magmatic underplating, which further melts the crust. Now this magma, as it is liquid, it has lower buoyancy and it needs to come up. And it comes up in the form of dikes and it can either form its own dikes like primary fractures or it can follow the weak planes, pre-existing weak planes in the surface. Now, as the dike is coming up, there are times where the buoyancy contrast reduces. So that time it forms horizontal or yeah, horizontal sill complexes. And with subsequent magma injection in the sills, 
ultimately the magmatic overpressure of the overlying crust it exceeds and the magma again moves up and ultimately reaches the surface what can we say from mafic dike swarms mds is the short form of mafic dike swarms so mafic dike swarms they are generally give us uh, provide us with a window to look into the precambrian mantle and like uh, the geochemistry of the mantle how it might have behaved at that time what might be the source of the melting what kind of evolution it might have undergone all these things can be understood by studying uh, the geochemistry of mafic dike swarms secondly we have paleo continent reconstructions now the like as we know that the tectonism tectonism is still active like continents have been together and have moved apart through the course of time so when two continents are together let me give an example like australia and india when they were together the time like during that time the lip events that have occurred have affected both the continents in the same way so the dike swarms which we find in pilbara craton are uh, of western australia are related to that of those in the dharwar craton so these continents when they are together the dike swarms which form are continuous but now they have been separated so if we do the geochemical study or radiometric dating of the dikes in the dharwar craton and correlate it with the other continents for example pilbara craton in australia we see like we can develop a barcode and we compare the continents which were together at that time and with the help of dike swarms we can effectively form paleo continent reconstructions like the orientations in which the continents were together now how this helps this helps in mineral prospecting for example if there um, is some sulfide deposit in um, australia and uh, in the present like the paleo continent reconstruction which we have done via um, studying dike swarms we are observing that the mineral uh, mineral deposits are in continuity from australia to some part of dharwar craton so now we have uh, we can limit our area of interest from the entire of the dharwar craton to particularly that part which saves a lot of time and money and helps us in uh, for better mineral prospecting mafic dike swarms are also known to host nickel cobalt copper and pg deposits so like uh, mineral chemical studies and um, if some dike swarms are hosting these sulfide deposits or nickel cobalt pg deposits then they can even be targeted as mineral um, reserves now coming to my area dharwar craton so dharwar craton as you know is a benchmark representative of paleo uh, of precambrian rocks um, so it basically consists of um, three lithologies the it has a basement of peninsula nisic complex it has two generations of greenstone belts the older sargur group and the younger dharwar supergroup and it has uh, younger potash rich granites a representative of it is close bed batholith now dharwar craton is classically divided into two parts the eastern dharwar craton and the western dharwar craton the divide being the chitradurga shear zone or rather the chitradurga east margin shear zone which is marked over here by a dotted line however recent workers are suggesting that the eastern dharwar craton should need to be further divided into two parts that is the central and the eastern dharwar craton and the central dharwar craton the eastern boundary of the central dharwar craton they are suggesting to be uh, um, this um, yeah uh, um, what what is hakolar kadri hungun shear zone which is, which marks the western which is lies in the western part of the chitradurga shear zone, um, of the close pit battle somewhere over here now dharwar craton has been interjected with uh, nine paleo proterozoic uh, mag mafic magmatic events and two archean mafic magmatic events but my study is basically concentrated on the paleo proterozoic dike swarms as you can see the map over here this is a dike map uh, after uh, this uh, french and heman 2010 so the dikes are largely concentrated in the eastern dharwar craton this might raise a question that probably why is it so there might be some difference in the lithology or something which resulted in the intrusion of the dike swarms specifically more in the eastern dharwar craton than in comparison to the western 
Now the workers suggest that there might be two possible reasons. One is the lithosphere underneath the EDC is very fragile and it is thinner. So it is easier for the magma to intrude through it and be emplaced on the surface. Another reason is that if you see the lithology over here, the lithology of the Western Darwar Craton is largely mafix and volcano sedimentary deposits, uh, greenstones basically. But that of the Western, uh, Eastern Darwar Craton is largely felsic lithology. So as we know that it is easier to melt the felsic lithology, so probably the dikes might have intruded into the Eastern Darwar Craton more easily. These nine dike swarms, they span in age from 2.37 billion years to 1.79 billion years. I won't go into the details of the dike swarms. If anyone is interested, uh, my email ID is given in the uh, title slide. So they can mail me and I can provide them papers. Now, how to identify the dike swarms? First, what we do, since these dike swarms are regional dike swarms, so they need to be identified via satellite imagery. Because if you directly go to the field and try to identify them, it becomes really confusing. So these are some of the Google Earth images wherein you can see these linear features. These are dikes. Now they can be um, confused with other lineaments. So what we generally do is that we um, take a profile uh, perpendicular to the uh, dike trend. Like in Google Earth only, there is an option known as uh, vertical elevation profile which provides us a vertical section of the line that along the line that we have drawn. So if you can see a ridge like feature, then probably it is a dike. Now, <clears throat> these uh, dike swarms, uh, they need to be um, characterized first via remote sensing. So you can see that this one trending from north northwest to south southeast uh, is one swarm and this one trending from east southeast towards east southeast is another one so what we do generally is that we try to establish a cross-cutting relationship between them and try to uh, like have an idea about the relative chronology over here you can also see like preliminary structural analysis can be done as you can see that the east uh, southeast trending dike swarm has been displaced by the later north northwest trending dike swarm so then after we have identified the dike swarms in the field, uh, in the satellite images, we, um, we um, decide um, routes, like uh, pathways for the field work. Like we uh, decide sampling locations and we decide, uh, like mark roads. Like this one over here, you see this is a road and we select those kind of roads which um, intersect the maximum number of dikes so that we can sample maximum dikes in a short period of time. And while we sample in the field, we need to be very careful because many a times it happens that the trend of the dike is so confusing that you end up sampling from the same dike, which is not the objective. Now, after we have marked the samples, the sampling locations and marked our uh, route path, we go to the field and then we need to identify dikes in the field. So dikes generally, uh, generally, if you see the younger dikes, those of the Cretaceous or the Paleogene dikes, they show diff like distinct um, margins, dike margins, and they are not very weathered. Like I have a picture uh, in the subsequent slide, you will be able to relate to it. But uh, Precambrian dikes, basically, they occur in two forms. They can occur in bouldery outcrops, like the first two pictures over here like big dolerite boulders um, spread out in, along the trend of the dike, or in cross sections or road cut sections or canal cut sections, they occur in as highly jointed cubic blocks like these. These are some of the field photographs from my uh, field work. Like uh, from these two figures, uh, these two images are how dike swamps actually look from way far apart. Such big dikes are easily identifiable. But there are also smaller dikes which need to be paid attention when you're moving in the car so that you don't miss out. Now, when a dike is intruded uh, into the country rock, it um, generates associated fracture systems. Like when the dike is intruding, it um, applies uh, a pressure on the either side of the um, country rock, which is in a direction perpendicular to the trend of the dike. 
now this uh, stress is stored in the rock and can only be released via subsequent fracturing so we found conjugate fracture systems related to the dike emplacement in uh, the vicinity uh, in the country rock uh, proximal to the dikes like uh, in this figure the dike was somewhere around uh, this side of the outcrop now once you have identified the dikes you need to take samples you know that depends on what is your objective of sampling there can be geochemical sampling there can be structural sampling and other categories of sampling so firstly i am dealing with geochemical sampling now for geochemical sampling you like for any kind of sampling you need to find in situ samples like um, if there are boulders which have rolled down so you don't actually know whether that boulder is a part of that dike or it has been displaced from somewhere else so if you collect that sample it won't be a representative of that uh, of the dike so you need to find in situ samples then we need to avoid dike intersections because when two dikes are intersecting and you collect a sample from the intersection itself then you are not very sure whether which dike you have sampled so if you are finding any dike in intersections the wise thing would be to move out of the intersection go along the trend of the dike and sample the dike that you want then for geochemistry we need fresh unaltered samples so so that the whole rock geochemistry of the sample is a representative of that of the magma or the that of the magma source magma because if it is altered it will give us um, like there will be some sulfide enrichment there can be some silica enrichment and it won't be representative of the dike itself and then like um, in a dike as you can see here the um, part which is the least um, altered is generally the central portion so it's wise to leave the uh, margins move towards the center and sample from here for geochemical sampling to get the representative geochemical data and now dolerites are very strong i have very bad experience in the field that i kept on hammering a dolerite for more than half an hour and it did not break so you need to look for weak plane like over here if you see this is a weak plane over here this one is a weak plane so that you can jut in the ch uh, chisel and pluck out the rock so that way you can sample more number of dikes in a short period of time otherwise it would be very it becomes very frustrating when you are hammering and it's not breaking mm, then when you break the samples you need to collect chips for thin section analysis because thin section first you need to do petrography to identify which samples you need to do uh, need to select for geochemistry so chip samples are very necessary for uh, making slides and the most important thing is that please and please remember to mark your gps locations from where you are taking the sample because once you move out of the field and you come back to your lab and you try to find out where this sample has been taken from and you realize that you have not taken the gps location it's physically or economically not possible for you to go back to that place and identify that so it becomes like there is no use of that sample if you don't have a location now for petrofabric analysis now what is petrofabric analysis as the name suggests in this we try to identify the magma flow directions uh, via studying the um, syn magmatic uh, textures or structures in the rock mesoscale microscale it depends on your objective so basically it's related to structural analysis uh, and it tells us that which direction the magma has flown and uh, flowed and you can identify like you can predict the direction of the plume center and subsequent other things so over here also the first two points are same that you need to select in situ samples and you need to avoid dike intersections for the same reasons as described earlier now over here like earlier i had said that you need to sample from the center of the dike to avoid alterations over here you need to sample from the dike margin why is it so when the magma is intruding into a fracture the fabric or the yeah the petrofabric actually is best stored or best uh, preserved in the chilled margins because it gets immediately uh, solidified and it does not uh, undergo any subsequent magmatic movements whereas if you move to the center of the dike after the magma cools there is magmatic drain back like the magma goes back into the fracture 
or there is some kind of um, like there are there are other turbulent kind of flows there are other turbulent dynamics which won't give us the actual direction in which the magma had flowed so over here for petrograph petrofabric analysis our main objective is to identify the direction in which the magma flowed to identify that you have to sample from the chilled margins like over here you see that the samples have been collected like this is a dike okay and the samples have been collected from the southern margin and the northern margin and also if possible if both the margins of the dike are visible then you can sample along the width of the dike which gives you a complete profile of the whole dynamics of the magma movement and again yeah you need to mark gps locations from where you have collected the sample then measurements we need to do in the field the most important is you need to note the trend of the dike from which you are collecting the sample because without the trend you don't know the swarm and without the swarm you don't have any reference to correlate your data with then you measure the dike width if possible like over here you see the width of the dike has been measured and if you are getting continuous exposures and the length of the dike is not that big uh, that long you can move along the strike of the uh, dike and measure the length of the dike now the width and the length of the dike are necessary for um, this thing for they can be mathematically treated and you can um, calculate the volume of magma that has come out or the depth from which the magma has come out i'll be discussing briefly about them later this figure it is not very clear but you can realize that the blue one denotes a trend of one dike and the red one denotes the trend of another so you are definitely not supposed to sample from here either you will sample somewhere over here or somewhere over here for the two dikes that you need and obviously measure the trend now the methodologies and prospects in which research can be done in mapping dike zones first is geochemical characterization like when there are 10 different dike swarms in an area you need to collect samples from each dike swarms and you need to characterize you need to um, do their whole rock geochemistry you need to do their trace element geochemistry and you need to characterize them so that is the basic step so that you can approach your problem in an organized way like over here i had characterized 2.21 billion year mafic dike swarm and 2.22 billion year mafic dike swarm this is a spider diagram that all of you have um, probably read about so this the red one marks the 2.21 and the um, black one marks the 2.22 as you can see there are differences in their trend which allows us to characterize them into two different dike swarms second is Srinjoy, uh, yes, sir? Srinjoy, sorry to interrupt mm -hmm. uh, but slightly running short of time so you can uh, quickly yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, sir. sorry to interrupt you yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah i'll wrap up just one more slide is left and then there is radiometric dating, which allows us to identify which uh, age the dike belongs to. Generally, we do bad light dating or uranium lead dating uh, of dike swarms. And then we do paleomagnetic study. Uh, here is a figure where we are, um, the Euler poles of the uh, dikes are plotted. It allows us for uh, to do subsequent uh, paleocontinent reconstruction. And magnetic anisotropy, uh, anisotropy of magnetic susceptibility rather, it is a petrofabric analysis which tells us the direction in which the magma flowed by studying the orientation of magnetic, mineral, uh, magnetic minerals in the dike. And lastly, geostatistical processing. That is which I was mentioning the width and length of the dikes from which you can mathematically calculate the volume and the depth of the magma chamber, etc. Now research motivation. First, to get into research, you need to like do not only depend on the notes that are provided in class. You need to read textbooks because that is the only way your concepts are going to be clear. Then you need to clear examinations. Either if you are answering, uh, if you are pursuing PhD in India or abroad, you need to clear NET or GATE in India. For abroad, you need to clear GRE to FL. But it is advisable if you are going abroad, go for the MS. And then it is easier for you to get into PhD from there. Then you need to attend conferences so that you know what people are working on. You know who is working on what and you can make contacts. You can just mail them about 
any doubt or any problem so that they know that you exist then the most important thing is that you need to frame a statement of purpose or a research plan so you read you make a research idea and with that you approach someone if he is finding it interesting he will not deny you and the main approach to research is that i call it rtpd that is read think plan and do so you need to read various researches identify the gaps in the research and visualize the problem then you need to think critically on the problem identify what is lacking in them and realize what can be done about it you need to plan a methodology and try to design at least more than one approaches so that one if one fails you have another to reach out to and then you need to do meticulous data collection field work and lab processes so that you there is no human error in your data collection and then finally you statistically process your data to come up with some um, valid conclusion which allows you to write publications and make some contribution to the field of science so these are the references which i have used in this presentation and lastly this is a figure uh, this is a google earth image of the dikes uh, mafic dikes in the eastern darwar plateau you can see the dense exposure of dikes and i like this picture very much so i have put it over here and i hope you enjoyed the presentation thank you for your patience here thank you shrinjoy uh, i will request students to put up questions if they have in the chat box or they can even unmute their mic and ask shrinjoy if they have any questions we'll wait for 2 minutes Uh, pg is platinum group elements like platinum palladium all that like if you see the uh, periodic table there are certain elements platinum palladium they belong in a group so and they generally have similar properties and they occur kind of associated so we call them as platinum group elements students you can put up your questions in the chat box okay if there are no more questions okay there is one question you have talked about magmatic underplating and formation of seals can you please shed some light on it yeah Aparajita okay so yeah so magmatic underplating means when there is um, a strata or um, any country rock so the magma pools below it so it provides heat from underneath and partially melts that um, that um, rock body so that is magmatic underplating and when a dike um, like when magma from the magma chamber or magma reservoir tries to reach the surface initially it forms dikes uh, like for, it can form its own dikes or it can just follow the pre existing weak planes in the rocks and when the negative buoyancy uh, when the buoyancy contrast or the density contrast is um, minimal it does not it basically the idea behind it moving up is the density contrast and the buoyancy so if that is gone if the rocks lying on top of the magma are of lesser uh, density then it will move horizontally and form a sill and then with subsequent magma injection ultimately the pressure builds up in the sill and it further forms vertical or inclined fractures um, or dikes which are infilled by magma to form dikes to ultimately reach the surface i hope i could make myself clear yeah i'll share my email id over here ma'am you are muted yeah thank you um if any questions are there you can directly email 
Roy. Okay, so there's one more question which has come up now. Is it possible to have multiple dike intrusion in the same dikes? Yes, definitely it is possible. Like um, if you see cross section, it is generally it happens like that only. So if you see the cross sections of the dikes, you will see the joints, the vertical joints, and you see uh, like once a dike intrudes and then the subsequent magma is intruding, it pushes apart the earlier formed dikes and then again intrudes. So there are multiple intrusions in the same fractures. So hence we can get uh, like multiple chill margins. We can get uh, horizontal columnar joints. So these are the indications that one fracture has been multiply intruded by magmas. Generally occurs in all kinds of IPs over there. Sinjay. Yes, sir. Myself, Rajesh Srivastava. You can add that there are seated dikes also in ophiolite complexes. So that is a multiple intrusion example of multiple intrusions. It's just I wanted to add it. Yes, sir. Ma'am, you're muted. Okay, since there are no more questions. At the outset, I would like to say that the lecture was very informative. And we got a great insight into the different processes and prospects of studying mafic dike swarms. I'm sure students attending this session would be vigilant enough to keenly observe dikes in field the next time they set out for field work. Lastly, I would also like to point uh, that the uh, uh, the point that you stress that students should be re should be motivated to read books and should take up research field, uh, go into research field. Thank you once again. The next speaker for the day is Man Andre. I would request Sir Manoj to introduce the next speaker to us. Over to you, Manoj, sir. And thank you, Srinjoy, once again. Thank you, ma'am. Uh <coughs> Thank you, Vinita. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Johan Andre. Uh, Johan uh, completed his grad graduation from uh, Togoli College, Margaon, and he's completed his uh, MSc from uh, Goa University in Geology. Subsequently, he completed his MSc in Petroleum Engineering from Harriet Watt University, Edinburgh, UK. Then he started his career as mud logger from Cyrotron Technician and OLX Private Limited, Verna. Subsequently, he joined Slumberger in uh, May 2012 as mud logger in uh, Abu Dhabi. And since then, he has been working in Abu Dhabi uh, as data analyst, followed by uh, unit supervisor, and then subsequently led uh, the team for uh, remote operations engineers. Currently, he is performance live engineer team lead at the Mumbai Center of Slumberger. It is indeed a pleasure uh, to have uh, you, Mr. Johan. I request you to kindly take over. Uh, a very good morning uh, to all of you present, including uh, the staff of Gentry College. Thank you, uh, Sir Manoj, for having uh, given a brief introduction. Uh, I will not waste much time, so I will present. Okay, is the uh, presentation uh, visible? And am I audible to everyone? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to speak uh, very briefly about uh, surface logging. Uh, basically, this is the career path I took after completing my uh, petroleum engineering studies. Um, so surface logging is uh, is uh, a much uh, newer way of uh, or a larger, broader scope, which covers a lot of services, and uh, and uh, it, 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 uh, more conventionally, it used to be called mud logging. 
Uh, but nowadays, since we cover a lot more, uh, uh, we do a lot more detailed analysis of uh, information and data, uh, we also go away from the standard geological experience and even go into drilling uh, uh, experience and even safety. So it is now more commonly known as surface logging. So I'm going to give a brief insight into this. So basically, where do we work? Uh, surface logging, so the environment of our work, Okay, uh, most of you must know that uh, mud logging or uh, other surface logging uh, is done on the rigs. I'm sure everyone is aware of uh, what a rig is. So I'll speak briefly about uh, the different types of rigs that we have. Uh, this is a rough illustration of uh, the major types of rigs that we have across the globe. On the right side, you can see we have the land rig. Okay, so uh, this you might have even seen if you have gone out of uh, Goa and into other states like Gujarat and even Andhra Pradesh or Assam. Uh, then that is mainly called a non-shore rig. So then we have a different set of rigs, which is basically offshore. So we have the drilling barge. Okay, uh, the drilling barge operates mostly in a water depth of up to about 60 feet. Uh, further from a drilling barge, we have a jack-up rig. Uh, this is a very common offshore rig that is used in shallow water drilling. Uh, it uses a leg system, a three leg system which attaches itself to the seabed. Uh, then the next one, we have a semi-submersible or a floating type of a rig. Okay, it has a very large pontoon at the bottom, which uh, is filled with air and helps it to float. So these are used for deep sea drilling, uh, which uh, the jackup cannot go to. So as you can see, it uh, does drilling from about, uh, up to about 9,000 to 10,000 feet. And for ultra deep, uh, ultra deep wells, we use uh, drill ships. So drill ships are mainly used for exploration wells in ultra deep setting. But they go up to 12,000 feet. Uh, so I'll show you a rough few images of uh, basically all these kinds of rigs. So for the onshore rig, this is what a land rig would look like. Uh, uh, this is a bird's eye view on the right side of what the land rig looks like. Uh, for the offshore eggs, okay, this is a jackup which uh, I have extensively worked on. Uh, this is a very shallow type of rig, as you can see, three legs. The rig uh, is fixed to the seabed, but it, it can also float and move away, be towed away by supply vessels. This is a, a compliant tow platform, basically. So this is fixed to the seabed by a jacket leg structure, uh, similar to what you would see in any. Uh, uh, you know, a mobile tower or something like that. Uh, this is a floating rig, which is a spar uh, platform. It has a very, a very tall vertical cylinder, which you can see a very small amount of above the surface of water. So that uh, helps it to float. Uh, then you have the uh, other type of uh, semi-sub, which is uh, has a pontoon at the bottom. If a lot of you had watched the movie Deepwater Horizon a couple of years back, that's the kind of a rig uh, when we had the incident. And this is uh, the drill ship, okay? so it has a dual uh, mast. If you see common in all these rigs, you will see that uh, it has a tower sort of structure common. So that structure is called a derrick. And a derrick is what uh, basically is used for drilling uh, all the oil uh, wells. So let's get into the definition of uh, surface logging. So conventionally, it was known as mud logging. Uh, so basically, what we do in uh, mud logging or surface logging is we monitor the rig site activities, okay, the rig site operations, and we also do analysis of the drill cuttings and the hydrocarbons which are brought to the surface by a circulating drilling medium, okay, and all this together will will create a detailed record. Now I will speak uh, a little more in detail about uh, all the points mentioned in this definition. So this detailed record, in other words, is called a mud log. So this is a pretty uh, major component of uh, a mud logging service. It is a mud log. This uh, mud log is uh, used majorly by uh, the oil operator company, the well site geologists, you know, for future planning uh, or for exploration on the next project. Uh, so what are the objectives of surface logging? So we have uh, surface logging basically does a select and describe the drill cuttings. Okay. So we have sample catchers on the rig who will collect these samples. They will prepare uh, certain uh, samples for just for analysis and description. Okay, so the description of these samples leads to interpretation of the type of mythology present uh, in the well. Okay, so this is all based only on the drill cutting. Then we also estimate 
certain properties such as porosity and permeability of the drill formation. Uh, these uh, these properties are quite important because uh, without porosity and permeability, you would not have any sort of fluid movement on the formation. And the fluid that we basically all look for is oil, right, or gas. So these are hydrocarbons, and without porosity and permeability, you wouldn't have them. So we also monitor and maintain drilling-related and safety-related sensors and equipment. So we basically have sensors placed all over the rig, which monitor the rig activities, which is more drilling related. And we also have certain sensors only for the purpose of safety, okay? For basically for gas detection, toxic gas detection, such as hydro hydrogen sulfide, which is H2S, also explosive uh, gas, such as uh, uh, methane, which is CH4. Then also another objective is we estimate the pore pressure, okay, of the drill formation. Now in our system, uh, or rather, there is a formula, okay, which cal which is based on drilling parameters, which calculates or gives a pressure trend, which is also known as a D exponent. So this D exponent helps uh, uh, pore pressure analysis, okay, in evaluating the type of pore pressure that is present down in the formation. This is only attained after we drill the formation. So uh, largely also we collect, monitor, and evaluate hydrocarbons released from this drill formation. So hydrocarbons is nothing but uh, the type of oil and the type of gas that is released, but most of the evaluation is done for the gas. We also maintain a time-based and a depth-based record of drilling data. Okay, so this drilling data for us in our drilling lingo is called as parameters. So we have two types of data, which is time and depth. I will go a little more into detail on the next slide. So uh, later on, uh, what basically we have that looks like a mud logging unit, okay, or a surface logging cabin. So this is a very uh, general cabin uh, uh, of a surface logging uh, company. So you can have different sizes of it. It can be a little longer. It can be shorter. It all depends upon the type of service you provide. It depends upon the space constraints on the rig itself. Uh, so, but ideally or generally, it is about 30 by 8 feet uh, uh, containers. This is what it would look like inside. I know it looks like uh, a NASA Space Center, but it is not. It is a very low level center in that sense. Uh, if you see this uh, panel over here, the center, this is known uh, generally as a data acquisition system. It houses basically the servers that we have, which uh, record all the data. It houses the uh, analysis uh, panels for gas evaluation. Uh, on the left side, the screens that we see are basically simple computers, okay, which we call as stations. And they have a lot of screens that help the crew inside the unit monitor the various activities, prepare various reports, etc. So this image, as you can see, uh, shows a little about how it looks like inside a mud logging unit. A typical mud logging unit would have a mud logger here describing his uh, sample. He has a rock color chart in his hand. Uh, so basically, what consists of a mud logging unit, the personnel? So core mud logging would generally have three types of personnel. If you go into specialized services, you would have even more, but I will not speak about that. So the core mud logging personnel would start off with a sample capture. So if you were to join the mud logging industry, the surface logging industry, you would join the sample catcher because you have no prior experience in this industry. So a sample catcher basically collects the samples, okay, that comes out of the well. He bags these samples, okay, and he prepares the samples for analysis. So if uh, after a few uh, couple of uh, jobs on the rig side, you, can, you may get promoted, and you do get promoted to a mud logger. So a mud logger is a very important uh, personnel inside the mud logging unit. Okay, because his main task, okay, is to identify and describe these drilled cuttings that have come out. Okay, he also interprets the type of mythology on the mud log. Okay, we have a vertical representation of the different layers of mythology. He also performs maintenance of the various equipment that we have on board, and he also monitors the real-time rig activity. There are a lot more uh, 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 job details that a mud logger has, but this is what is uh, the core part of his work. After the mud logger, we have uh, a data engineer. So a data engineer basically prepares the daily and final deliverables. So these are basically the reports. Okay, so he so whatever the mud logger prepares in terms of the mud log, including uh, the mud logging report prepared by the data engineer, 
is what is the daily, and the final report is prepared after the end of the project. He also monitors the real-time activity on the rig, similar to a Maglogger. He also performs equipment maintenance, and he does calibrations of all the sensors that we have on the rig. He maintains the material inventory, and he also communicates with, with stakeholders. So stakeholders are basically the personnel on the rig side from the client operator company, or we have the uh, personnel from the drilling contractors, or even any other third-party contractors. He's also uh, in charge, or he also has to mentor his junior crew. So the data engineer is completely responsible for all the operations, activities, and the crew, which cons consists inside the mudlogging unit. So basically, how mudlogging works. Okay. So before I go into detail about how it works, I will show you a small uh, schematic of uh, how mud is circulated. Okay. Uh, I've been informed that a lot of you are watching this presentation from a mobile phone, so I imagine this would look very small to you. So I will show you a more detailed image uh, after the slide. So this is a very skeletal structure of a land drilling rig. Okay, we have the, the shakers on the right here, the pumps on the left here, and the pits in between. This is the drilling derrick. Uh, we have the mud logging unit over here. So the mud logging unit has various sensors uh, connected to all this equipment with a lot of cables. Okay. So going into detail, uh, on the image on the left, what we have here is the mud pump. Okay. So the mud pump, what it does is it sucks mud from the suction tank. There are various tanks on, uh, on the drilling rig. So one of them is called as a suction tank because its sole purpose is to provide mud to the mud pump. The mud pump pumps this mud up the swivel up to the standpipe, okay, and it pumps it into this part, which is also another a drive mechanism, which we call the top drive. Okay, it basically op operates uh, the or controls rather the drilling. So this mud is pumped down the drill string. Okay, the drill string is what uh, in the end goes down the hole and does the drilling. So we follow the yellow line. The mud goes down, and on the right side image, it continues down in, through the drill string right to the bit. The drilling bit is always rotating. Without rotation, you will not do any drilling. So the mud flows out of the drilling bit okay, and up along the sides. So this side is called as the annulus. So now what happens is as we are drilling, since we are drilling, we are basically crushing the rock. So this crushed rock is uh, in the sense called drilled cuttings. Okay? So the crushed rock has to be brought up to the surface for us so that we can study it. It also has to be brought up so that the hole remains clean and you are able to drill further. So the mud itself is the only medium that can bring up this crushed rock. So the mud itself also is another science. Okay, the, uh, the name given it for it is mud is because it actually looks a lot like dirty mud, brown color, but it is a whole different science. It has a lot of chemicals in it. Okay, there is a, a specific person assigned who prepares this mud on the rig and is known as a mud engineer. So the mud uh, can have various types of density, okay, which uh, allows the formation to be held in place, okay, without any density, the formation of the wall of the well would have collapsed. So the mud has a specific density equal to or greater than the formation that helps the formation stay in place. It also helps the fluids, uh, or the hydrocarbons, or even water remain inside the formation so that it does not uh, seep into the well. So this mud has sufficient viscosity. Okay, which allows the drill cuttings to be brought up to the surface. So now that explains a lot about the circulating medium that was part of the definition of surface logging. So now how it works. So what is rig activity? Rig activity, another uh, word, a broader sense word for rig operations. So we have various sensors okay, placed at different locations of the rig to measure and acquire real-time information. I'll speak in detail about these sensors a little bit later. All these sensors are connected to the surface logging unit via bus cables. Uh, this information along with computation. So we receive very raw data from these sensors, right? So we need this information to be processed, okay, and to be computed in a certain sense. Okay, so this is done in our in our system, our server. So these result in time-based and depth-based acquisition data to be stored on the servers. So stations, another word for computers. Uh, are connected to the servers and are located inside the surface logging unit. Uh, if you remember, inside the, the logging unit, I showed you the various screens. So this is what it refers to. So these stations help the crew to monitor and process the acquired data and provide detailed reports to the client. So this is where basically the mud logger and the data engineer sit. 
and they do all their work. So we also have uh, satellite client stations, okay, similar to the station we have in the unit, but these are satellite stations which are connected to the server, but they are outside the logging unit, okay. So they are basically kept in the cabins of the client representatives on the rig, uh, or the drilling contractor, such as the driller, or even the mud engineer, because they need to monitor the activity that is ongoing in real time, okay. So now I'll talk about a few of the sensors, but uh, rather the core sensors that we use in mud logging. So the images of these sensors uh, are taken from my company, Slumberger. So each company has its own type of sensor. So it may vary a little bit, but they all do the same job. So this, uh, as you can see, is a tank volume sensor. It's a radar-based sensor, which is fitted on top of a tank, in the mud tank. Uh, this does not give you direct volume. Okay, the sensor basically reads the height of the mud present inside the tank. So in our system, we enter the cross-sectional area of this tank. So basically, after computation, it gives you the volume of the mud present in the tank in real time. So that is what I meant, that the sensors give us raw data, but we need to have some sort of processing and computation done in our system that give us this information. This is a sensor that is fixed to the drawworks. Now, a drawworks is basically nothing but a large uh, drum, okay, which uh, controls the movement of the drive system on the derrick. So basically, it moves up and down. So we need to measure this movement with our sensor. So this is basically a proximity. It contains two proximity sensors inside and a flywheel, so connected to the shaft of the drawworks, so the drum. So this, in after computation, gives us a measure of the depth at which we are drilling. That is a pretty rough uh, way of saying it. Then we have a sensor, another proximity sensor, which is uh, basically the small yellow pin on top. So this is installed inside a pump. It basically measures the rate at which the piston moves back and forth. So this in our system gives us a computation of the rate of flow the mud is pumping at. Then we have a pressure sensor. Uh, this is a 15,000 uh, uh, 15, PSI uh, rated pressure sensor basically installed uh, on various locations, but if you remember the circulating uh, mud going from the mud pump to the standpipe before it reaches the dry system. So we have a sensor installed on the standpipe which basically measures the pressure given by the mud pump to pump the mud down the stream. Okay. So now we have the temperature sensor. So we need to measure the temperature of the mud basically before it enters the well and after it comes out of the well. This is very uh, important information to know the uh, to get a rough idea of what would the bottom hole temperature of the well be. Then we have a demand density sensor. This is a Coriolis based sensor which is pretty accurate. Okay, it gives you the density of the mud the same, which is before entering the well and after coming out of the well. This sensor is a is a is a, it's called a tension line or transducer. In, in general specific terms, it, it measures the weight of the string that is uh, hanging off the dry mechanism down the well. We need uh, a lot of information based on this weight. Uh, this sensor is basically a return sensor. It, it uh, basically installed at the flow line where the mud comes out of the well. It does not give us a measurement of the flow rate or the volume that is coming out. It only gives us a ratio based value, okay, which we represent in percentage. So basically it tells us if the mud has, the flow has increased or not. It does not give us any, uh, value indicated uh, parameter. So how is all this uh, information represented? So we represent it on two types of logs. Okay. First, we have the real-time log. Uh, this might look very small to you, but it's all right. Uh, you don't have to get into the details of it. I will explain it in brief. So this is a real-time log. As you can see, the central column is uh, has a time. So as time goes by, we need to know what is going on today. So these curves, each curve represents an individual sensor or a computed value, which is done by a system, okay? So what do we have? Hook load, uh, basically that was the weight of the drill string, uh, shown in the sense in the previous slide. So from this hook load, we can also calculate how much weight is applied by the drilling bit on the formation. This is very important because we need to apply a certain type of uh, weight on the formation to be drilled. We cannot apply no weight, basically it won't drill, or if you apply too much weight, we will probably damage the drill string and the bit itself. So we need to know at what rate the drill string is rotating. So we have a RPM sensor. Then basically we have resistance to rotation. We need to measure that. So that is called as torque. Uh, this is very important in knowing whether the drill string is actually rotating downhill or not. 
So standpipe sensor, the pressure sensor that we spoke about earlier, which gives us the pressure of the mud pump. Uh, then we have the mud flow rate calculated by the pump uh, sensor, which gives us in gallons per minute, the uh, GPM. Then we also need to know at what rate we are drilling, right? So this is called as the rate of penetration ROP. Then we have sensors across, or uh, rather in almost all the mud tanks. Uh, these are also indicated on this time log. Then we have temperature sensor, which is also indicated here, and the density sensor. So now this is a time-based uh, log. We also have a depth-based log, which is more specifically called as a drilling log. Uh, in this drilling log, we do not have all this information, like mud tanks, etc., but we will have core drilling-related information, like uh, your rate of penetration, uh, then your weight on bit, uh, or your RPM, or even your weight or your hook load. Uh, this is plotted against the uh, interpreted lithology done by the mud logger. Okay. I'll speak in detail about that uh, later. So now we will go to what probably everyone is waiting for. How is geology related to mud logging? Uh, so basically, what we do is we collect, right, the drill cutting and we analyze it, and we do the interpretation. So this analysis includes a microscope identification, okay, and we use that for description of the lithology as well using standard uh, description methods with a rock color chart as well as the naming conventions. So we describe the lithology, uh, if there are any minerals present, uh, and if you're lucky enough to see fossils, very minor fossils, uh, minute or small fossils. We put the same samples through chemical tests. Okay? We also put it through a fluorescence test. And this fluorescence test gives you an indication of whether there is any oil in the uh, sample. I'll speak about it uh, later. So we also provide a qualitative hydrocarbon gas analysis. So basically the gas that comes up uh, when we drill the formation, right? There might be some gas stuck in the, in the formation, but this is released when we drill the formation. This is just a rough idea. This gas travels up with the mud and we have a gas system which basically churns the mud, okay? And releases the gas from the mud and this is sucked into the mud logging unit by gas lines or gas tubes and we have uh, equipment which actually analyzes this gas. But we only get qualitative uh, analysis. We do not know how much of gas is down in the formation. We only know what type of gas is present in the formation. So basically, we have standard hydrocarbon analysis, that is of gas, for all, uh, from methane to pentane. Uh, these are the alkanes. Uh, we also have uh, specialist uh, gas equipment that gives even higher alkanes uh, but uh, that is not part of core uh, standard mud logging or surface logging. So we have uh, we prepare this detailed formation evaluation log to the mud log using all the above lithological and gas information along with some drilling parameters. Okay. So sometimes on the rig side we do coring. Okay. Uh, these core samples are collected and analyzed. So what is coring? Okay. Basically, uh, imagine uh, running a metal straw through wet sand. Okay, and if you pull out the straw, basically you have collected the sand as it is. Okay, you do not destroy it by drilling or, or, or crushing it. So this is called as a core sample, but it is more largely uh, works with microscopic identification and description of it. We do not uh, run it mostly under the microscope, but if you do have to crush it and understand it, uh, look at it under the microscope, you're also welcome to do so. So basically I will speak about uh, the equipment which we use for sampling. So this is part of a rig, okay? This is called the shale shaker. This is basically the final exit for where the drill cuttings come out and they fall off down into the waste pit. The sample catcher comes here. He has to place either a bucket or a tray below to collect the sample. So he will come uh, at a predefined interval, okay? So he may need to collect samples, say, at every 10 feet or every 30 feet. It depends upon the client's uh, requirements. He will come here, collect the sample, and he will clear off the excess sample so that it is, uh, it remains a new, a fresh, so that more samples can be collected for the next set interval. So this uh, samples collected go through a sieving process. Okay, you have uh, standard sieves. Uh, on top is the most coarse sieve, and at the bottom you have the finer sieve. So this ranges uh, in uh, from two millimeters for the coarse sieve up to down to 63 microns for the finer sieve. This is basically the size of the poles in the sieve and the straining. So why do we need to see the sample? Well, basically the samples, uh, what we need to analyze and study below the microscope are between fine to the medium C. The coarse C largely uh, catches uh, or rather traps all the large uh, uh, drill cuttings or even larger 
larger uh, parts which we call as cavings. So cavings are not drill cuttings. They're basically when the wall starts falling off in parts and pieces. So we do not need to study this under the microscope because it is not representative of the formation that they are presently drilling. It has come from somewhere above. Okay, so this is an image of core samples. Okay, this is uh, it's kept in order of depth and uh, sometimes it is labeled. Usually it is a uh, two to three meters or even one meter core samples. So the samples that we collect in, in mud logging are packed in such kind of uh, bags. We have the sample envelopes on top, which collect uh, dry samples. And the wet samples are bagged in plastic bags and put in uh, large boxes. Okay, And these are given to the client for archiving or, or further chemical analysis or studies. The core samples, on the other hand, are even sent to reservoir laboratories for uh, you can say simulation of how the, uh, of the formation properties basically, or the 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 way the formation is behaved. So they simulate using the temperature and pressure on the sample on the core samples, uh, and they get a lot of information from it. So, what is the other equipment that we use? Okay, for identification. So we have the binocular microscope. A standard microscope uh, would be somewhere between 5x to 40x magnification, but we generally use 10x magnification for analysis. Then we have the auto calcimeter. So what is this calcimeter? So basically, uh, here you have to put in crushed sample of your lipid cuttings, okay, fine powdered sample, along with a mixture, uh, basically a diluted uh, hydrochloric acid, that is 50% acid and 50% water. So this put together in a tight, airtight chamber what happens is if there is any calcium carbonate present in your sample, so the HCl reacts with it, okay? So it reacts with it to give out carbon dioxide, okay? So carbon dioxide is gas. So what this happens is inside a tight closed chamber, the gas will exert a certain amount of pressure on the chamber. So there is a small pressure sensor on the top which measures the amount of pressure. So this helps in, in uh, direct relation to how much of calcium carbonate is present in the sample. The higher the amount of calcium carbonate, the higher amount of pressure. So this gives information that the sample could be mostly uh, lime based, a limestone rather. Okay. So this is a fluoroscope. Okay. So this gives you an indication of the hydrocarbon shows. Basically, it tells you whether there is oil in the sample or not. Uh, this is what a degasser looks like. This is part of the, the first part of the gas equipment that is dipped in mud. It churns out the mud, and gas is uh, released from the mud inside the chamber and is sucked up. Uh, but this is what is we normally refer as a standard degasser. This is a more advanced type of degasser. So basically, it's generally called a constant volume degasser. As you can see, it has a probe uh, down here at the bottom. So this probe is put in the mud. It sucks mud continuously uh, at a constant volume, a fixed constant volume. And there's a small chamber below here which contains this probe. So the volume never changes. So if the volume never changes, the amount of gas basically is kept. Uh, you can uh, have a constant volume of mud, so you have a constant reference or a guide to how much uh, gas is going up or down. While on the standard degasser, you know, if you dip it more in mud, you may get a higher gas reading. If you, if you keep it higher up in mud, you get a lower gas reading. Why? Because along with sucking gas, you also suck air. So if you dip it further down into the mud, you will have a less uh, column on top for air. So a less amount of air gives you a higher gas reading because you have less oxygen. Uh, less, uh, less atmosphere. Uh, this is uh, basically a gas analyzer. It is situated on the data acquisition uh, system or the panel show, which was shown in the middle of the log unit. This analyzes and separates the types of different types of gases that we get all the alkane. It also analyzes the total amount of gas that we uh, have in the in the mud. Okay. So, what do we? How do we do this visual identification? Also. As you can see, this is what we know as sample tray. The sample catcher collects the sample. He prepares these slides or trays rather, uh, and he marks them with a small label, giving the interval or the depth at which it is collected. Uh, the ones against the wall are actually kept there for drying. They need to be dried quickly so that you can do quick analysis because sometimes you drill so fast with a lot of samples coming, you need to be quick at your job. So what do you see under the microscope? So this is how drill cuttings look like under the microscope. Uh, even if you collect any sand or sediments from, from the beach, it would look a lot like this. But these are little larger cuttings than sand. So you have different lithologies, as you can see, identifying shale, uh, limestone, you can even have clay stone. So the geological description of these samples is uh, not extremely detailed, like how we did back in uh, academic uh, schools. 
it is a more rough representation. Why? Because it is so fine and so small that we cannot have a detailed description. And it is majorly uh, just to identify the type of mythology present. We, no one goes to do a research paper unless it is required, of course. But that is done with the samples of a fact and archive data. Okay. So how do we identify hydrocarbon shows? We spoke about the uh, fluoroscope earlier. So we have... Excuse me, um, excuse me Johan. Yes. Johan, uh, you'd like to wrap up... Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, the next yes. slide is lined up. Yeah. Yes. So Thank basically, you. this is uh, done under ultraviolet light. Okay, uh, direct fluorescence on top. And we have uh, down here, which is cut fluorescence by adding a solvent. This is basically for oil that does not show direct fluorescence. Basically, needs to seep out of the uh, green, green pattern. So this is exactly how it shows you when before you add the solvent and after you add the solvent. Okay. So basically, what is a mud log? This is generally how a mud log looks like, the representation of it. It has similar parameters as a drilling log, which is the ROP. But it will more have uh, have more about your lithology, like your cuttings, your your gas values, okay, your chromatograph, that is your alkanes, uh, even your fluorescence information, okay, and then we have the vertical representation of the layers of lithology that we have, and on the right side we have basically the description, okay, this is very standard description, it depends on the client, or we have a standard PVPG uh, description. So most mark logs nowadays use gamma ray, which is uh, from another downhole logging service provider. Now, basically, gamma ray is, uh, helps us in better interpreting the lithology because higher gamma means there's more argillaceous matter, lower gamma means the less argillaceous matter. So, basically, uh, it doesn't play the sand or limestone is very clean. So, what are the, de the deliverables in uh, mud logging? Okay, pretty standard deliverables include the mud logging report. So, this is a very detailed uh, report depends how you prepare it on an Excel or you have an auto report. It, I, it basically has information about whatever operational activities you had for the past 24 hours, uh, including the lithology collected in the past 24 hours and the values that is your drilling parameters. The daily time activity log, as we saw earlier, you know, same 24 hours log. Then we have depth based logs, we provide mud log and drilling log. We also have another one called like, the gas log. This is a little more detailed version of uh, giving you more information on the gas. Uh, then we also provide ASCII files. Uh, maybe you're not familiar with what an ASCII file is, but imagine it's like an Excel, which contains all the information depth-wise of each sensor rather or each computed value in numerical form. Okay, so you have a drilling ASCII, which is all your drilling sensors, and your gas ASCII, which is only your gas data and information. So at the end of the well, or the end of the project, we prepare a very detailed and large report called the end of the report or the final well report. This contains the information about the whole project, okay? And it is in line with what uh, geology department uh, the client wants, okay? So this is was very brief about what mud logging or surface logging covers. Uh, it is a very uh, large, it plays a very larger role. Uh, I was not uh, uh, able to show you everything, but what I was able to show you is actually the core of what uh, mud logging is. So I thank uh, you everyone for uh, paying attention and I hope it was clear and understandable. So if anyone has any questions, you may uh, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Johan, for that uh, lucid presentation. Uh, if there are any questions? We'll take one or two questions. Yes. Yes, there is one. Uh, uh, there is a lot of questions. Okay. Uh, let me get to the first question. After hydrocarbon are extracted from the seabed, what is done with the areas of extraction? Does water pressure above the seabed play any role after extraction? Uh, no. So what we do not extract any hydrocarbon from the seabed. Uh, the seabed does not have any hydrocarbon. It's basically a mixture of uh, your top layer sediment and water. Hydrocarbon is present down in the formation, which is known as the, uh, which, which contains basically, uh, uh, how do you put it? Uh, from your sandstone or your uh, limestone reservoirs. So it's contained in reservoirs deep down. Okay. Uh, we have a source rock which provides the hydrocarbon to the uh, reservoir rock, and uh, this is capped off by a uh, cap rock, which is normally shale because shale has very high uh, 
porosity that uh, does not have much permeability. So what we do is then we finish drilling the well, right? So the well is actually uh, goes on the completion phase where it's actually capped from up okay, using a well head. Uh, none of the well is open to the rock. Once we finish drilling, we drill it section by section. Each section uh, smaller than the previous one. So this is actually cased off or covered with a metal cylinder. Okay, so you don't have any exposure. Uh, the well is uh, the, the sediments are not exposed anywhere, so there is no water pressure relation to it. So duration of work onshore and offshore. Uh, typically, it is uh, you work for four weeks, or you work for six weeks, or you work for eight weeks, and typically you get an equal time off. Uh, but now, of late, uh, due to uh, headcount reduction, we we have a ratio of two is to one, so we work for six weeks and we get about three weeks off. There is one more question. Uh, I answered that one. Uh, Elcom, I'm sorry, but this is not my area of expertise. Uh, we only work for surface logging department, not for the drilling contractor, which is the big. So the kind of metal power used, I have no clue. Uh, they, they do keep it painted uh, very regularly, so it will not rust. OK. Uh, thank you so much, Johanna, for that uh, very interesting uh, lecture. You gave a very clear idea about the uh, uh, job description of uh, mud logger and data engineer. Uh, you gave a very detailed uh, idea about the various sensors used, uh, the logs and the equipment involved. I'm sure this uh, lecture will help all the budding geologists, the aspiring geologists who want to make a career in the uh, petroleum industry, especially the students who are right now in uh, MSc. I'm sure it will help them immediately because they will have a good idea about what uh, is uh, their role, uh, what will be their role in the uh, in the uh, beginning of the uh, 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 career in the petroleum industry. Thank you so much for your valuable time. Uh, we would like to have you further in future also to interact with our students. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity. Yes. So uh, next we have, uh, we'll move from petroleum industry to uh, mining industry. We have uh, Mr. Akshay Kelkar uh, from Australia. Uh, he will uh, speak on the uh, role of uh, geologists in the mining industry. I request uh, Alistair to introduce uh, Akshay to all of us. Good morning, everyone. It gives me an immense pleasure to introduce my friend, Akshay Kilkar. I've been knowing him since high secondary and thereafter we pursued BSc in the same college and masters at the same university. I remember Akshay being a very enthusiastic person, a very hardworking person, would have a good balance of uh, academics and extracurricular activities, something that uh, students should uh, take a note of. Okay, about the speaker. Uh, he completed his Bachelor's of Science in Geology at uh, Parvati Bhai Chuguli College. Thereafter, pursued Master's of Science in Applied Geology at Goa University. Thereafter, he pursued Master's of Engineering Science Mining in Western Australian School of Mines, Curtin University, Batch of 2021. Work experience. He's a, he worked as a lecturer at Parvati Bhai Chogule College. Thereafter, he was a junior research fellow at Institute of Science, Banaras Hindu University, Uttar Pradesh, India. He worked as an underground geologist at Granny Smith Mine, Goldfields, Australia, Western Australia. He worked as a field technician ECGM, Super Pit, Northern Star Resources, Kalgoorlie, Western Australia. 
is currently working as a mining engineer at uh, Gia Gold Mine, Goldfields, Australia, Western Australia. Over to Akshay, you can start your presentation. Thank you, Alison. I'll share my screen. A very good afternoon, everyone. I hope my uh, screen is uh, presentation is visible. Uh, so today I'm going to speak about the uh, role of a geologist in mineral exploration and mining industry. So I believe all of you are third year graduates or postgraduate students, and you all have some information about uh, what is economic geology and what is exploration geology and uh, wh what, what are the different mining methods and how does the mining go. So I'm just going to go into a little bit of detail where I'm going to show uh, what actually a geologist or mineral in exploration and mining industry does and what are the different roles that you all can perform while doing so. So the first question is why you should choose mineral exploration and mining industry as your career perspective. The, as you can see on the, as you can see this chart, so this shows the total copper, lead, and zinc produced from 1900s to 2015. So if you look at the trends, it's an exponential increase in the production for copper, lead, and zinc. Of course, the rate is differing between copper, lead, and zinc. That's, that has to do with the usage of this metal. But the overall trend is the production is increasing. If you look on the right-hand side, you have the crude steel production in millions of ton, and it shows a similar trend where the crude steel production has been ever increasing since 1950 till present, and it will go on. If you look at the historical and the projected copper production, as you can see, we are sitting somewhere in 2021, that's here, and the global peak for copper production is somewhere next in the next uh, around 2030 or 2035. So, and if you look at the chart, you can see that the demand will be higher than what the countries can produce. So of course the other alternatives will come in play where the recycling of the metal will be considered for the supply for the remaining demand. And if you look at the elements used in energy pathway in 1700s, the most three elements that we use were carbon, calcium, and iron. And if you compare it with 2000 and even today, look at the number of metals and elements that are being used in the energy sector. And this has to do with the new green energy and the renewable energies coming into picture. And, and some of the metals like lithium that has to do with the electric vehicles and electric equipments, which are powered by batteries. So if you look at this, for all these metals that we need, we, they need to be explored, they need to be identified, and then they need to be mined out. So to explore them, to identify them, and to mine them out, we need geologists, and that's why the career in the exploration and mining industry is promising, and of course it's lucrative. Now, if you consider the three different professions that are into exploration and mining industry, so you can perform three different roles as a geologist. One of them is exploration geologist, one is mining geologist, and the third is a resource definition geologist. Now, what is common between all three is the language of geology. So this is the, what you will have learned during your bachelor's or during your postgrad studies. And you're going to apply this when you start working as in either of these professions. Now, to become a resource definition geologist, you need to have some experience in exploration and mining. Now, what makes this field more interesting is that when you're working as a geologist, you won't be working only with the geologist, but you will be collaborating and working in teams with people from professionals from other disciplines and other backgrounds. They could be your mining engineers, geotechnical engineers, surveyors, then of course the corporate services and management, the metallurgist and non-technical profession. And if you consider the exploration geology as your profession, you'll be working along with geophysicists, geochemists, non-technical professions and corporate services. Services. So this gives you a good opportunity to understand and learn various different disciplines along with the geology. So if you spend some years as a geologist in mining or exploration, you'll be learning a little bit about mining engineering or geotech or survey. And that's really good because then you'll become all rounder and then the communication with the other 
people from the other department becomes much easier. Now, what are the actual jobs of a mining geologist, exploration geologist, and resource definition geologist? So exploration geologists, they are mostly associated with field mapping. They do core logging. They do drill planning. And of course, look after the, all the drilling projects. Similarly, mining geologists look after underground and open pit production. They are the responsible for controlling the grades of the uh, ore that comes out. And of course, they handle all the projects. And if you talk about resource definition geologists, they are the one who define how much is the, they look after the resources and the resource present in that particular area. I hope uh, you all know what is the difference between reserves and resource. If not clear, I will uh, explain that in the subsequent slides. So uh, forget for this typo. So what is a mineral exploration cycle? So if you consider a mineral exploration cycle, the first thing that you do is to identify a prospective ground. So as you if you're aware, the first lecture of Sinjar Dattai explained about how the dikes can be used to understand different metal deposits and narrow down where they occur. So using the geology and stratigraphy, we can narrow down uh, prospective areas where mineralization can occur. And then from further, we can plan on and commence a low impact exploration. That means you, you will try to spend as less money as you can and try to get information possible. But if you hit some ground and you get some grades, then of course you will plan and commence for advanced exploration. And after advanced exploration, you will hand over that data to a resource definition geologist who will tell how much is the actual content of the ore, what is the actual grade, and then whether it's viable, economically viable or not, that will be decided. And then if it's yes, then the mining operation commences. So this is the whole cycle of exploration, how it goes on. This is a diamond drill rig, which is used in exp exploration for geology. So as you can see, this is mounted on a truck and it's very mobile. And when you talk about Australia, especially the Western Australia, the only city in Western Australia is Perth and the rest all are regional towns. And the distances between the regional towns can be as, 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 as many as thousands of kilometers. And because of that distances, it's remotely, it's not possible to have set up uh, different stations uh, at every exploration site. So what is preferred is to have a mobile exploration rig so it can be transported everywhere. And as you can see on the side, this is a small or crib room or a campsite where they have uh, systems in there with computers and the laptops where they can collect all the data and they can see how the drilling is going on. Now, what about core logging? So as a geologist, you may be uh, have done a lot of practicals where you have had handheld samples where you have identified the minerals, different lithologies, different textures, and identified the rock, and you must have described them. This is very similar. Only thing is that instead of a hand specimen, this is a core drill. Uh, so when the, when the diamond drilling is carried out, so the rock samples come out like this as cores, and then they are kept into core trays where they are labeled to know where the drilling, uh, where was the drilling carried out, what was the depth at which the samples were recovered. And as you can see, uh, the, it's, it's very difficult to identify what rocks they are in the drill core. As soon as you spray some water, the, the cores light up and you can see all the different colors and the rock types. So what do you do with this course is that as a geo logging geologist, you will look for different lithologies. You will try to see what are the rock types, what are the minerals occurring. You look for different alterations. So it could be sericite alteration or hematite alteration. You look for structures, structures such as fault, folds, veins. And you'll also look for some mineralization. As you can see in this image, uh, you can see arsenopyrite, pyrite, and pyrohotite. You'll also look for RQD, which is rock quality designation, which is used by the geotechnical engineers. And this data will be used in case uh, the, the reserves uh, come out good and they are going ahead for mining. And of course, you take of course you take orientation because in the core, when it comes out, the core gets rotated. So by the time you see some mineralization or structures, you don't know what is the true deep or what is the uh, strike. So to get the true deep and true strikes, the orientations are collected on the core and then they're converted based on the available data. And when the core logging is done, the core is cut into half. So half of the core is sent to labs for testing. So they can get the geochemical data for the rock types, the mineralization, and they can further study on that. And what is the remaining core? It's all packed up and it's kept in the core library. Now, as you can see on this image, there are a lot of core samples which are just thrown out. So this is usually happens when you are doing diamond drilling in an underground operation where you know the lithology, you know you have defined everything, but you are just drilling this to get the gold assays out. So when 
So when the gold assays are out, you take the mineralized section and you send it to lab for testing and whatever is the waste rock, you just dump it in the graveyard. And this is some samples of gold mineralization. So this is what I had encountered while doing coal locking. So this is gold mineralization, which is occurring in quartzites. So the host rock is a conglomerate and the conglomerate has a lot of quartz vein, which is hosting a lot of gold. And this is one more sample. Uh, which have been uh, submitted by Gloucester Ravidardo. He's a mining geologist. He's a uh, former alumni of Chokley College and Goa University. What is drill planning? So as you'll know, the, the most of the data that comes out is from the drilling and the course. So, so there has to be a geologist who looks after drilling and he plans everything. So as you can see, there are some vertical holes here which have been drilled and then most of them are inclined. So some of the vertical holes, they are initial ex exploration holes. They are drilled to see where the ore is located. And once they hit the ore, and when they collect the orientation, they know exactly how the ore is trending, what is the strike and what is the deep of the mineralization. And once they have that, they know exactly where to drill to hit the ore body. So now once they have drilled the vertical holes, they know how the ore is dipping. And once they know that, whenever the next drill design or the drill plans will be cre created, they will try to target the ore body at 90 degrees. That is why that, so the reason why they try to target the ore body at 90 degrees is because it provides you a true thickness of the mineralization. If you drill vertically, it may not capture all the information that is prepared and it may give you uh, apparent thicknesses and apparent grades that may, uh, in the long run, you may uh, calculate wrong assays and uh, provide get you a model with uh, wrong grades. Now, when you work in an underground, so most of the work that you will be do as a geologist will be underground phase mapping. That is, you go down to a development heading. This is a development heading, and they are, if you can see on the this is a ground support that has been provided to make sure that there is no collapse of the ground and this is the development phase so that means they are going to drill in this rock and they're going to blast it and they're going to advance in this particular direction so as a geologist whenever you get a surface you will go there you'll use a software or you can use a tab where they have got now modern softwares where you try to draw and mark the the shape of the tunnel then you get the you mark the different lithologies you mark the different structures if you have you see any kinematics such as uh, the the movement along the uh, along a fault plane or you can mark that if you see a fold you can mark the fold and then all this data gets saved in a server and along with this if you see any mineralization or any ore you will try to estimate the grades based on the ext uh, extent of the alteration and the color and then you will based on that you will mark for sampling location that means you're going to take samples from this phase, send it to lab, and again, you're gonna get the grades out of it because this is a development heading. If there is a gold in this and you can, can take it profitably, why waste it? You will take it out as ore. Now, these are some of the ore drives and development drilling photos, uh, which are shared by Atash Mokkal. He's a ventilation and paste infill engineer, and he works for a nickel operation. And he's also former alumni of Parvati by Chugli College. Now, if you look at these three photos, you can see there are some pyrite veins which are running across the face. And these pyrites contain nickel and the, this is the ore which they want to mine out. Now, as you can see, there's a difference in these two photographs. Uh, here, there are some narrow vein bodies and here you see in the foot wall, some uh, more mineralization. And in the right-hand side photo, the face has been also supported because there must have been some uh, rock fall in that particular section. So this is how the ore looks in the development phase. And if this is profitable, this can be also mined out. Of course, this is an infrastructure development. This is not the main target or the main ore body which they want to target in an underground operation. And on the right hand side, you can see some drilling pattern where uh, a lot of holes have been drilled. And the, the once this have been drilled, the engineers will fill it up with explosives and they're going to blast it. And this is how they're going to advance uh, the development. And when you do the face mapping of uh, consecutive phases, let's say you did face map here, then the, they blasted this particular ground, new face was exposed, you mapped this, and subsequently you'll go on mapping as a geologist, and then you will uh, update that data and create a model out of it. And that model will trace how the veins are uh, how the veins are moving along the ore body and what is their geometry and what is the strike and the deep. And this gives you a good and clear idea as to whether you're going in the right direction or not. 
Now, how do you save all this data? So as you can see, if, if you look at the number of drill holes that have been drilled, you can imagine that it, it, uh, the number of meters they must have drilled. So each of the holes could be something around 500 or 600 meters in length. All this data has been logged. Uh, all these space maps have been recorded. All this data is present. Now, how do you record and save all this data? So for this, you use a geological information management system, which is called Acquire Arena. This is a, one of the system that is available commercially, uh, but this is the most used one. And as you can see, you can use this on a computer, you can use it on a tab, or you can also use it on your mobile phone. And what it does is that as you are logging, as you are doing face map, you update information in this system. So this is uh, this is like a filler form where you have different options and you can fill all the information that you log. And once that information has been filled, it gets stored in a centralized server and anybody who is working for that particular company can access these files uh, and they can see what, what's happening and what's going on. So this is the final result, how it looks like when all the data has been updated. So if you can see on the right hand side, these are the core photographs that have been taken. and and if you see on the extreme left hand side, they have marked here different lithologies. So this is with the depth. So they have marked with different lithologies. They have marked with different alteration, different mineralization. And in this green color, these are all the assays that have been sent to labs. So one of the access for this software system is even with the labs where you do your assays. So you send the samples to the lab, they will test it for gold or nickel and they will find out what is the percentage and they will update it onto the system. So as soon as they update it, you get all the data. So what do you do with all this data? So as a project geologist or project uh, in the projects department, your job will be to use all this drilling data, all the core logs that are available and create a O-body model. So here you can see uh, this O-body extends up to 1.9 kilometer from the surface. And this, this is an open pit operation and the geologists are trying to find out how much of gold is there below. So they can go and mine it out as an underground operation. So as you can see here, there are uh, sub horizontal lenses of gold and there is some cyanide monzonite and cyanide porphyries which are intruding those gold deposits why this uh, porph porphyries are and cyanide uh, intrusives are important because they play a very important role from a ge geotechnical perspective because when you have an underground operation you need to keep that you need to keep the ground stable there should not be any ground collapse or level collapse so a geotechnical engineer is very more interested in what are the dikes types because uh, whenever a dike is encountered in a phase for example uh, let's say this is a one dike which has been or uh, this is a vein which has been encountered in the phase so of course there will be a rheological differences between the two rock types that are on the other side so this vein could be more competent or less competent than the surrounding and as you know that we have mined this particular out or we have um, we have taken all this material out so there is uh, no pressure which is being exerted from one of the particular direction so there could be a squeezing of the ground and this vein can just pop out and that is a geotechnical hazard so once the O body model has been created by the project geologist, that all the data is sent to resource definition geologists. So if I have, if you remember, I mentioned that exploration geologists and mining geologists they both share their data with the resource definition geologist as the operations continue. And what the resource definition geologist does is that they use all this data, they apply a geostatistical method and they convert it into a block model. Why it is called block model? Because they are blocks and the blocks could be of different size. It varies from uh, the metal that you are looking after. For gold, probably the block sizes will be smaller, but if you go for iron ore operation, the block sizes could be more. So what geostatistical method that they use is a Kriging estimator. and using this creating estimator they try to estimate what are the gray what are the what are the grades throughout the uh, targeted drilling spaces and when they have this overboard uh, when they have this block model ready then they can finally start working on whether they can actually mine this or not and whether whether this resources that they have encountered whether they can convert it to a reserve or not so a block model is a heart of any mining operation because without a block model uh, mining won't commence uh, nothing can be done at, a, at a, on a mining scale because this block model dictates you where the ore is where what is what will be the grade and you can plan accordingly and just to give an example what is a resource and what is a reserve so this is this is a 
kind of a block model where I worked. Uh, this is a site from Gruyere gold mine. So as you can see, they have drilled to a depth of more than uh, two, three kilometers and they have got or more than 1010 uh, meters and they have collected different rock types. They have sent to labs and they have got some grades. So as you can see along the drill uh, lines, you can see the grades, you can see different colors. So here you can see red is one, green is 0.5 grams. Similarly, the rest all are grading. Now, once that is done, they create a block model and then the block model is shared with the mining engineers and then the mining engineers will work it out from economic perspective that out of this, all the resources, what we can actually mine out profitably with a given mining method. So as you can see, they have differentiated the block models into different zones. So you have this operating open pit where they have been actually mined out the ore and this is open pit ore reserve. So this is the actual goal that they have defined. They know that they can take it out profitably. Now, this is open pit mineral resources. That means there is gold here, but they have not worked it out. So they don't know whether they can actually extract that particular ore uh, economically or not. And then you have your underground uh, mineral resource. That means this is a future perspective that they're looking at expanding the pit and convert this pit into an underground operation. And this is again a framework drilling area, which they are going to target in a couple of years. But right now they have not drilled here. And if you look at the underground operation, what do you actually mine out is that you mine out the actual stopes. So as you can see, this it forms different layers of ore. So you create uh, different declines and you have different access which access you and which takes you below or above the lens. And once you are above or below the lens, you start drilling into the lens and you fire that lens as a stop and you take the all the gold or the all the ore out and then you take it out from the main decline and it goes for further processing. And if you consider production drilling, so this is an open pit operation. Now we will be switching from underground to open pit. So in open pit, so you carry out production drilling. So as you can see, these are the drill rigs. They are drilling through all the ground. And these holes will be later filled with explosives and then it will be blasted. So just for compare, this is a blasted ground. That means this the, the, the rock body or the ore which is present here, it has been blasted. So it has, it, it has been converted into fragments, but this is intact and this has not been blasted. So for hard rock mining, we need to blast the ore so we can easily to load and haul and it, it doesn't cost as much. So what does geologists play a role in all this? So here is an example. Here you can see that they had drilled a hole, which location was this, the pre-blast hole. And after drilling, they filled it with explosives and they blasted the ground. And after the blasting, the whole collar, whole collar moved from this location towards our right. And if you consider the, uh, the mid bench of the mid bench uh, location, it moved further away. That means if you had an O vein running from running here, which after blast, that O vein must have shifted to this particular location. So as a geologist, you need to track where the O is moving because the grade control is uh, the grade control is looked after by geologists. And if the grades don't come out, the geologist will be held responsible for it. So how do you know how much the ground has moved? So for that, you use something called as blast movement monitors. So these are small balls which have uh, electronic sensors in them. So what do you do? You activate them, you put them in the blast hole and post blast, you go back, you use either a drone or a handheld DGPS and you collect the information or the collect the location where the holes are, where these balls are present at the moment. And once you know, you can say that, okay, the old body existed here. Now it has slightly shifted towards, uh, shifted down. And then the new O boundary is this. So once you have defined where the O has moved, a geologist can provide a dig plan. That means it can direct the shovel operator or excavator to go and where to mine O and where the O waste is. Because uh, in an open pit operation, uh, a single truck that we use here is about 220 tons. And if you consider the average grade of a truck, average grade of a uh, mine is about one grams per ton. That translates to 220 grams of gold per truck. So if one truck of load which has ore in it is been identified as waste and it goes into a waste dump, the company is losing almost 220 grams of gold. And that's a lot of money. So doing this as a geologist, you can control the grades, you can save money and increase the profit. So this is a gold processing plant. So this is what happens after the, after the ore has been blasted. It has been 
uh, loaded and it gets hauled and it gets stored in the ROM pile. So this is run of mine pad. So here the geologist will split the gold into high grade, low grade and uh, different types. So uh, you can have uh, ore which is fresh rock, you can have ore which is uh, clay or your regolith. So different ore types have are stocked up here and the geologists then assign this particular ore type and then they put it through the crusher. So the crusher will crush these rocks into finer fragments and then again it goes to a grinding a ball mill or a sag mill which will find those rock fragments even further to a level of a uh, to a sand or even finer than sand uh, and then all this rock material which has been crushed, it will be sent to a pre leach thickeners where it will be settled and, and all the rock, because you add a lot of water while doing all this process. So here you make sure that all the rock fragments, they settle and then you can remove the water and then throw it, put the water in the settling pond. Now, what do you do with the remaining rocks that you put them in this leach tanks where you put uh, hydrogen cyanide and you add carbon in it. Now, what hydrogen cyanide does is that it takes out all the gold from the uh, from the ore that you what the ore that has been passed here and then it will pick up all the gold now as a carbon it is organic substance so it, it has again attended it has again a property which can attract the metals and what carbon does is that it will pick up all the gold from cyanide and the carbon will get enriched with coal and it's very easy to separate this carbon when the water flows from or this material has been transferred from the leach tanks and further from the carbon uh, the gold will be extracted so this is how the gold pouring is done. So here you have a furnace where they take the gold. Yes. Uh, you have to wrap up a bit faster. Yes. So you have a gold uh, pour here where you uh, where you take the gold concentrate and you pour it and you uh, heat it up to high temperatures and then you pass it through this where uh, the gold will be gold will settle in the first two slots and the remaining is just a waste. And then what you do is you pick them up, you put them in the water and then you cool it down. And this is how the gold brick comes out after the pouring. So this brick will be weighing something around 20 to 25 kilos. And, but this is not a pure gold. This is around 90 to 90, around 90 to 95%. It's again, send it further to uh, refineries where they further purify this and get the 100% gold out of it. So this is one of the open pit just to show you all. This is a KCGM super pit operation uh, where I worked as a field technician with the geologist team. So you can see uh, this pit is almost 700 meters deep from the surface. Uh, the length of the pit is almost 2.5 kilometers and width is almost 1.5 kilometers. So it's that big of a pit. And they have been mining from multiple cutbacks. And uh, the major ore body here is your dolerite dikes so you have a golden mile dolerite which is mineralized in this particular location grade varies from one to two grams per ton on an average and so so what makes again this life very interesting is that when you're working in australia in exploration or mining companies most of the operations are located remotely that means there is no town or village uh, nearby your operation so the mining companies or the exploration companies need to set up their camps so this is a this is a camp how the camps looks like so this is a camp from a gruyere gold mine where you have rooms uh, allocated for all the geologists all the non-technical professions engineers and everybody so you have even areas where you can play games basketball ta table tennis etc and most of these camps they have an airport attached to it because there is no road connectivity to these areas so you cannot travel the only way in and out is by a plane so you have an airport attached to it so you come and you board a plane in the morning you get here you stay here for a couple of days so usually your work roosters are eight days on six days off that means you will stay here for eight days you will work for eight days and you'll go back on a break for six days thank you uh, and thank you for listening and if you have any question uh, please let me know Uh, participants, kindly type in any questions if you have in the chat box. Okay, I'm just, okay so what metal is used in construction? Oh, sorry. Let's go. So, prospect of mineralogist and geochemist in mining. 
Uh, so a lot of uh, mineralogists and geochemists, uh, uh, they usually work as geometallurgists. Uh, they work as a geometallurgist and they, have the, they coordinate with the geology and metallurgists to understand how the ore is occurring. For example, the gold, sometimes it occurs as a refractory. When I say refractory, it means the gold will occur within the sulfides. So when the gold is occurring within the sulfides, it cannot be extracted with the with the process that I showed. So when the gold is occurring with the sulfide, the, it needs, the sulfide needs to be taken out. They need to be separated. They need to be roasted. And once they get oxidized, then they can you can extract the gold out of it. So yes, there is a scope for mineralogist and geochemist in mining. But for everybody, they need to start uh, as a graduate uh, geologist where they spend some time with the exploration team and the mining engineering, uh, sorry, ge mining geologist team so that they understand the whole process and then only they can go on with these specialized roles. How sustainable are post mining operations in Australia? Uh, yes, from a sustainability perspective, uh, uh, Australian mining companies are held more accountable and yes, they do have a lot of plans. Uh, for example, the mines that I have worked on uh, so far, they all have solar farms. That means the majority of the electric uh, electricity supply is carried out from a solar farm. And as you can see, most of the mining operations, they are moving to automation uh, and they are moving for electric vehicles. So all these tr dump trucks and all the shovels that we see operating in the few coming years, they will be uh, electric that means uh, uh, there will be no carbon emission no carbon footprint and it will be a green energy and of course after mining uh, uh, rehabilitation is a concern so in australia uh, they have a system called as rehabilitation levy that means every mining company needs to pay a certain amount to the government every year and if the company fails to rehabilitate the mining operation or their waste dumps or the pit the company the government will use that money and they will rehab they will carry out the rehab but from a restoration perspective australia needs to work on it because the rehabilitation only brings back the ecology to somewhere midpoint but not ex actually to existing how it was existing earlier so if you restore it of course then you won't see any difference between the pre-mining and post-mining landform or uh, ecology what software is used for mineral visualization okay so one of the thing is that if you want to work uh, in australia as a geologist uh, you need to be a bit tech savvy you need to have you need to know uh, or you need to know how to use a computer very well because there will be a lot of softwares you will be associated with so some of the softwares that we use are deswick or datamine or vulcan uh, to visualize all this so these softwares are used to create uh, geological models block models and all day-to-day -day work so as a geologist if you are very good with this software you'll be able to do all this task uh, very efficiently and whatever time is left with you you can utilize that to understand the ore body or the mineralization or you can actually do the geology stuff and of course some of the steps are repetitive so if you have some programming experience you can code and program the software to do the repetitive task on its own. That means you don't have to really do anything. You just provide the data and software will do it for you. So when you actually have the model ready with you, you don't really spend time do creating the model, but you actually spend time interpreting the model and uh, discussing it with the mining engineers as to how we can mine it and you can optimize it further. So if you have any more questions or regarding anything, so this is my LinkedIn profile. You all can connect with me on LinkedIn and I'll be happy to uh, answer any queries. Okay. Uh, thank you for the lecture, Akshay. It was very enlightening and enriching. And uh, I suppose uh, students and all the other attendees had a lot to learn from you, especially about gold exploration and processing. Thank you, Akshay, for the enlightening and lecture. Thank you so I much now, for giving this opportunity. I now request my colleague, Dr. Raghav Garkil, to introduce the next speaker. I hope uh, Ms. Pritismita Kumar has joined the meeting. Mm -hmm. Uh, with this, Mita, have you joined? 
Hello, sir. It's a uh, good morning. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I was just confirming whether you have joined. Yes, I have just joined. Sir, how are you, sir? So, I will introduce. Yes, sir. Good, good. Yeah. Uh, it takes me immense pleasure to introduce our last guest speaker, Ms. Mr. Smita Kumar. She present. She completed her B.Sc. Geology from Guwahati University, Assam, in 2015, and M.Sc. in Geology from KSKV Kutch University in Gujarat in 2017, and passed first. During her higher studies, she visited Agyathuri, Assam, Aravali in Rajasthan, Kutch in Gujarat, and Goa. In addition, she also did her internship under guidance of Dr. Vikash Gogoi at Guwahati University. She is well versed in computer softwares like CorelDRAW. She has also served as academic counselor for Vidyarthi Point for a period of one year. She is a civil service assistant and preparing for the same the past two years. Recently, she has cleared prelims of Assam Public Service Commission and hence is eligible for final exam. When she came down to Goa for her BSc fieldwork, I took her batch of students for fieldwork in surrounding us within Goa. At that time, I was ad hoc faculty at the Goa University. Since then, we have been in constant touch with each other. I hope our students will be enriched with guidance over the preparations of civil services exam with her lecture titled Geologist as Civil Services Aspirant. I now request Vipisvita to take on the mic. Uh, hello, sir. Hello, everyone. I hope everybody is fine. Hello? Yes. Yes, we can uh, hear sir, you clearly. Uh, sir, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you clearly, loud and clear. Yes, yes. Thank you, sir. So, hello, everybody. So, here, uh, as a means, I am uh, not a profession, right? Uh, I'm not in a profession right now. I'm trying to get into a profession which is which with uh, which is your civil services. So I am an aspirant right now. So all I want to do is give some insights of the civil services examination, the perks, and everything related to the job, and especially to the students of Goa and how they can take part uh, regarding this. I'll give you a little insight on it. So uh, first off, this is the topic will be mind the geology as an uh, uh, aspirant for civil services okay so first of all especially the third year students are usually confused what to do they all know that they have to go for masters and then they have to give gate and all but there are also other things which they can uh, opt for like uh, masters they have to do because if you give uh, if you're in masters your mind becomes broader you can relate to things more uh, you, uh, your practical knowledge increases so after doing masters uh, if you want to opt for civil services after bsc that is also a good option because the syllabus is all in your um, bsc only in your bachelor's only but if you do masters that is also good after masters you can go for gate then you can go for gsi and then also minerals and uh, mines department in your state governments then you can go for geoscientists then petroleum corporations then there are some civil services post which you can apply even after your graduation which will be your state forest services then soil rangers then your state and central civil services this is a very important factor because you know what happens some students they don't get admitted into masters but they they get panicked they don't know what to do this is what happens you know before applying to any university you don't know whether you will get or not because there is so fierce competition so uh, many of us we don't know what to do but this is not it with geology without masters also you can go for civil services with masters that is uh, well and good so 
you can go for state civil services there is soil rangers then there are uh, forest rangers also you know uh, they they uh, I made this decision uh, during Corona that I need to go for civil services because there are many perks as a geologist for the civil services. First of all, you will ask that why civil services? You see, there is job satisfaction. You know, there is no monotonous job in there. Your mind will be regularly utilized and you will see things in a broader way. You will be sharp in everything you achieve. You will have presence of mind. You know, being street smart is also one of the requirements you need to in today's life because being street smart, street smart is what that you can uh, find solution to a minor problems. That minor problems becomes huge problems if you don't know how to solve it. Okay. Now, in civil services, you have job satisfaction. You can help in nation building. Then there is diversity of work good salary also diversity of work is uh, you may be appointed for foreign services also you can represent india you are going to make the schemes you are going to uh, be in the planning in the nation making you will have a part in it which will give you a big satisfaction good salary you know after seven pay commission uh, the salary of a civil service of an IS is almost equal to that of the corporate sector. Yes, you heard it right. After seven commission, it almost became equal. Also, you have you will have a great power and prestige with that post. And of course, there is job security. You know, only the president of India can remove an IS officer. Also, that too with lot of uh, you know court cases and reviews and all and investigation so the, uh, you have a job security also you know nowadays the sectors are becoming privatized so there is no privatization thing in here so that is why you can offer civil services now let me tell you this what is goa's contribution in is officers you know goa contributes uh, goa have contributed from 1951 to 2020 only 0.0, .0 two percent of is officers that is very less on 0.02 percent of is officers from a state like goa is uh, you need to see in this matter that this is a matter of concern actually because other states like assam is comparatively less developed okay you know it is still developing so even assam has 1.1 then mizoram and these all have 0.72 but goa is 0.02 percent in is from 1951 to 2020 so we have to look at that also then next is how what goa needs okay why i, I want you to pursue these civil services see Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, they contribute 17 to 18% of the IS officers. Now, if an IS officer is from Goa or Bihar, what will they understand about Goa? Like what Goa needs? What is the problem in Goa? Let me give you an example. Beti Bachao, Beti Parhao. Okay. This Beti Bachao, Beti Parhao is in, uh, relevant in those areas, which has female infanticide, infanticide and all, you know, girl child killing, uh gender no gender equality but that that portion is irrelevant in northeast because in northeast we have matrilineal society we have equality in fact transgenders male and female we all are equal here so a majority portion of our taxes goes into schemes like this but who are benefited more rajasthan bihar and up these all states are benefited but it's a good uh, initiative, you know, Beti Bachao, Beti Barhao, but this is have uh, less relevance to states like us who needs uh, industries more or who needs uh, representation on national platform more. You know, when we say Goa, Goa doesn't mean beaches or fanny. Yes, this is a unique character. You know, your tourism sector is very good, but Goa is also more than that. Your culture should be represented everything should be represented so goa needs to come on national platform not only in tourism in administration also what do goa needs what goa's culture uh, if we want to revive a, a old culture or an, a ancient culture what do we need you know to bring goa into national map because it it can't be always about uh, up bihar or rajasthan or madhya pradesh you know whenever we uh, hear about them they, these states are given more emphasis you see goa uh, south india northeast uh, states they have controlled their population you know uh, 
population control is a very good thing. They have controlled their population. But in reward, they didn't get anything. In fact, those four states, because they have so much of population, they are getting more grants, more help from our uh, central government because they have more population. But we need to make our plans in this way. We need, we need our uh, uh, means uh, state representatives in na national platform in executive platform that uh, we can show our own problems to those areas. So that is why you need to go from Goa to national platform. That is how you can represent your state. That is how they will know what Goa wants because it is always majority versus minority. They will always see what the majority of the population needs. A person coming to Bihar, coming from Bihar and appointed in Goa will never know what people of Goa needs. Only you will know. You, there is a post, two to three posts. One IS officer will be there in Goa. Then one IPS officer will be there. Then tax officers will be there. Revenue officers will be there. So videos, you know, block development officers will be there. So if a local will come to that uh, post, he will know more about this. So from 0.02%, you need to increase it. Goa needs to come here. So next, after what Goa needs, we need to understand how about, I am going to link geology into administration. Nowadays, we all know the natural hazards, the problems we are facing, urban flooding and everything. So geologists, are always helpful in these things. You know, geologists, we know about disaster management, we know about environmental geology, we know about engineering geology. So we are going to apply those things into the administration because every time a person who is not a geologist comes, he has to hire another geologist to make a report on that area. What are the reliefs? What are the features? You know, so if you are a geologist, you can definitely help them. You are going you are going to be a part of it. You know, disaster nowadays the buildings which we made, in fact, the roads which we make should be disaster prone. Should be there should be risk management, there should be environment geology because there are landscapes we need to know uh, know. So geologists re are really helpful. All I have seen is geologist is an asset in administrative work because you are going to put your knowledge in every planning for which they need additional people. So, you know, you are like an asset to administration. Next, I'll tell you why to take geology as an optional subject for civil services exams. You see, geologists are highly, geology subject is highly scoring. You know, whatever you write out of 10, you will easily get eight because you are writing all these things from your BSc classes only from your third year, second year. Then this is a scientific subject. You know, this is not dynamic and scientific subject always has an edge over or advantage over any humanities subject like literature subject. You can write many things in literature, but one scientific subject, you can write one and a half page of answer. You easily get a, uh, eight marks, 10 marks, but humanities, no matter how much you write, you are not going to get so much marks. So, and it covers most of the syllabus, you know, there is not only your geology optional, there is geography, you have extra disaster management, you have environment. So they all, you know, almost 40% of the syllabus is covered of uh, general science. If you take geology as an optional, you, it will help you in disaster management. Disaster management carries 30 to 35 marks in uh, your GS paper, general science paper. So if we are already into it, if you already know what is disaster management, that 30 to 35 mark scoring will be so much easier for us. So we are always into this. Uh, we are all easily, we can easily, you know, connect with the papers for uh, in the questions. And also, you know, this year, IFS uh, topper, uh, Divyang, Divyanshu Nigam, he is a BTEC from Beach Pilani. Okay, he's a BTEC from Beach Pilani. He, uh, but b even being a BTEC, he took geology, geology and forestry. He scored rank 44 in all India. So he, after that, he, he went for IFS. So your subject is so good. The geology subject is so good. In fact, the uh, BTECs are taking, other people are taking, but we, we are, uh, we need to come out. We need to take that subject and we need to go for civil services. You know, we often say that, uh, there is corruption, 
there is problems, there is implementation in schemes, there is environmental issues, the uh, infrastructure which they are making is not disaster prone. So when you are coming into the mainstream, after that, you can easily go for uh, the schemes, the plans, you are going to implement everything. You have a knowledge already and you are going to use these things to implement. So, and geology as a subject is so scoring and the best part is it is a dynamic subject. There are no current affairs. The one of the most important thing in uh, UPSC or state civil services is your current affairs. For current affairs covers so much marks, almost half of the marks in any optional subject. So your syllabus is static. Nothing new is done in geology right now, and they are not going to come. So UPSC repeats the question. If you uh, solve the question papers, there is a hundred percent uh, guarantee that minimum of eight to ten questions will be common. There are 19 questions out of which if you get eight to ten questions common, that uh, it is a very good help for you because other students will have to study new data every year. Thus, geology syllabus of 2010 and geology syllabus of 2020 is the same. So you are going to repeat what you are studied what you have studied in your bsc days and you are going to write it so and out of 500 marks uh, scoring 350 is so easy but the other subjects you can score hardly 300 but in geology you can easily score 350 if your answers are better than that 400 is also not impossible and uh, the marking system is very rewarding it covers most of the syllabuses, no current affairs, repetition of questions. You can copy paste your notes what you have studied in geology. So, and in fact, if you need any notes, I have notes for gate also. If you need any notes, you can easily ask me. You can contact your teacher. You can easily ask me for the notes. I'll provide you everything. I'll give you the link and you can easily uh get scored you can easily get your marks in fact i have made uh, notes for civil services mind because i am giving mains if you want i'll simply uh, make a pdf copy out of it and you can take it so you know especially the third year students you are fresh right now you are all you already have so much things from first semester to sixth semester all you have to do is revise apply for it and you can easily get the job so uh, all I want to say is don't always uh, limit yourself to, you know, uh, gate or oil or ONGC, you know, you might not get uh, a job in there. If you get, that's very good. You might not get job in there, but you don't need to panic or you don't need to lose hope because geology as a subject and optional in civil services is so, so, so good. So you have to come take geology and you can easily pass the exam okay so that is all i would love to say and also regarding the notes and all please you contact sir i'll definitely provide you everything okay thank you prithit smita for uh, for such an informative lecture thank you yeah, now the floor is open for your questions. Please type in your questions in the chat box. Uh, yes, sir. There are many, many geologists already in the civil services examination, uh, especially out, uh, I think in Assam itself, there are four to seven that previous year and they have taken uh, geology at, uh, itself. So yes, there are many, many civil services from geology. Welcome, sir. Students, please ask questions. You all can even type it in the chat box.
Okay. Okay. Okay, how much labor intensive study do you put in per day? Okay, uh, see, you need to study smart. You don't need to study so much. You need to study smart. Okay, uh, even six hours a day is enough in breaks. Two hours, then you can do your work. And then, uh, then you can take a break. Then you can do another two hours. So that is not a problem. But you need to start uh, whatever two hours you're putting that need to be effective okay you need to do smart study you need to know what you study and also the gs parts are mostly from ncrt from class 6 to class 12 is what you need to study so that those are very easy write books is all you need and that is all for mains you can go uh, after uh, studying prelims for six hours a day you can go uh, the mains becomes very easy because all you need to do is in the gs section you can add uh, the current affairs part and in your optional that is the same so uh, mains become very easy if you study prelims properly guidance i feel any uh, guidance i feel is an issue for students in goa don't you think yes uh, okay i'm going to on my video okay you see uh, guidance is yes because uh, nobody tells them that you need to go for civil services. If someone wishes to go for civil services, they will take admission in coaching classes or they will prepare. So if, if in colleges, we give uh, them uh, details about how you can go for civil services or what are the options for you, then I think you can go for it, for the civil services. You see, in Assam government, there is a scheme that only in 5,000 rupees, they are giving UPSC coaching. In all of some, we have around 100 seats. Every year, there will be an entrance. Very simple questions, mostly from current affairs and some from polity. If you pass that in 5,000 rupees, you are getting a course which usually will cost you around 80,000. So this is how the government is also helping. In uh, government colleges also, they are giving classes at least for three months. Or in private, uh, in private, uh, private coaching institute, they reach out to those colleges. They say that they are going to give an insight to the students on how to appear for civil services exam. So I think government plus colleges plus teachers plus mentor, mentors, these are all the things which are going to encourage a student for uh, going for civil services. Um, yes, my email, right? Okay, I am going to mail here. Then uh, that is mail pretty one at the rate of gmail.com. I think my at the rate is not working right now, but okay. You just put an at the rate, okay, in place of the dot. So that would be my mail, okay. Or I'll, I'll give it to Raghav, sir. Then you can mail me if you need those notes or book and all, okay. There's one more question, Pritya Smita. Uh, yes, how many seats are how many seats are given out every year in civil services? That's the question. Okay, uh, you see, this keeps. Uh, it depends how many posts, but it will be around uh, 700, 800. So uh, the competition is tough. But it's not altogether impossible. You see, you don't need to do rigorous study. All you need to do is, uh, you need to perceive your, you need to do everyday study. Everyday keeping those things in mind, you can easily solve those. And you have to give some more importance in prelims because prelims is quite risky. And you know, uh, what is the pass mark of prelims? Sometimes it is not even 50%. That is out of 200, getting 92 will be enough. So that is uh, sometimes it is 95, but most of the time for open category, I'm talking that is 92 to 95. And sometimes I think it's, uh, at one year, I think it reached 99. That year, the paper was quite easy, actually. Uh, but for I think for students having uh, reservations, that is quite easy in 80, in fact, in 70. So all you have to do is 40 right questions and you can easily uh, click that thing. Click the prelims. Okay. I hope all your queries are resolved or your questions are answered. If you have any more questions, 
you can mail it to uh, to Miss Pratishmita Kumar. Uh, the email ID is provided in the chat box. I would like to thank Miss Pratishmita Kumar for delivering such an informative lecture. Uh, the fact which she pointed out that only 0.02% of IAS officers are from Goa was very yes. surprising to know. And I would say that it is high time that our students think out of box and take paths which are less taken by attempting this, uh, attempting this civil services examination and cracking those. Um, she also highlighted one point that being a geologist, we have an edge over the uh, others yes. for clearing this examination, which is interesting and which all the students should note. note. Um, I'm very sure that by listening to this lecture by Prithismita Kumar, uh, our students must have got inspired and along with other exams which they are answering, they will also take UPSC's exams seriously and try cracking those examinations too. Thank you, Prithismita, for such a wonderful talk. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I would now request our Sir, uh, sir Dinanath Parap, HRE of Geology Department, to present the vote of thanks. Over to you, Sir. Hello, everyone. Hello, Sir. Hi. To conclude with today's lecture series. <clears throat> I'm here back. I welcome you with very good morning. Now it's good afternoon. We really enjoyed your lively and informative talks on various topics. I'm very happy to say we are being enriched with your expertise and experience and very informative knowledge. I myself feel like coming down to your stage and start my career back from where you are. First lecture we had of Srinjoy Dutta, very informative on research methodology, how to go about for mapping, then sample collection, then further uh, processing of those samples by geochemical methods and further analysis and how to go about the research. It was really motivative for the learners. Even I myself felt like going back to the student age and start learning from you all. Then next speaker we had Johan Andrade. He had explained very nicely about the petroleum exploration, various techniques used on onshore and offshore drilling. It is also, again, a good career for a budding geologist. Then next we had Akshay Kelkar. He had actually taken us to the field in the open cast mine. And right from prospecting till the final product, of the ore deposits. The actual role of geologist we learned from his expertise and experience. And finally, Prithesmita, you have not only opened up the box for our new students for civil services. Yes, yes really, this is a time wherein our students also think of administrative services, not only of the field geologist. Yes. Okay, so I take this opportunity on behalf of my department, my colleagues, my college to thank you all and we wish and look forward for your expertise in near future. Again, we'll bother you, we'll tap your sources and we'll have more intersection means interactions with you all along with our students thank you, okay thank you once again and wish you. you all very nice weekend thank yes, you yes sir same to you sir yeah thank you